In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages. Amen. There's a Facebook page that says, the title is, If you grew up in Galva, Illinois, you might remember. Survey. Who grew up in Galva, Illinois? That would be me. <laughs> and me only. Not many people can say that they grew up in Galva, Illinois. I'm not saying it's a mark of honor. I'm just saying not many people can say it. Town of 2,700 people, very small. But the premise of the uh, Facebook page is that we have remembrances. We have things that we remember from our childhood. And, and they'll, they'll say things like, do you remember so-and-so? And it might be a person of great virtue or it might be a person of infamy. And recalling events that had taken place in their life and, and people that were important in their lives or people that had done crazy things. And so it's a way to just look back on the past. Well, what's so interesting about today's homily is that we have one person who's remembered and one person who is not remembered. We have Lazarus, who by all accounts should not have been remembered. He should not have been uh, remembered. If you grew up in Jerusalem, you might remember Lazarus. No, that he wouldn't have been on the list. Why? Because he was a common beggar that had nothing to present itself to the society at large. But there was another man there that was extremely wealthy, probably was the peak of society as far as power and prestige. He had such a big mansion that Lazarus chose that he would lay in his steps outside his door to beg for food and yet we know not this man's name now this tells us something that when we say may their memory be eternal during the memorials what we're essentially saying is may God look upon them and acknowledge them as being from him and of him and may we remember them as being a blessing forever and ever. But we have the memory eternal person, and we have the person, if you will, that everyone wants to forget. A tyrant. A man who had nothing good about him when it came to those that were lesser than. And so we see a picture of what happens in the afterlife. Now some would argue that this is a parable and a parable only. I would argue that in this kind of a situation, Jesus wouldn't just use a metaphor that didn't have deep truth to it. And so we need to take a look at the circumstances that Lazarus and the no-name man have. One has suffered greatly throughout his life and now finds himself being comforted. We say, Father, is he being comforted just simply because he suffered? No, because he remembered God in his suffering. Even though he lay on the porch of a rich man and could not get a crumb, he remembered God. His heart was inclined towards God and not just laying there envious as all get out and, and you know, wishing he could be Lazarus the rich man. No, he was a man who was submitted to the will of God, even if it meant that he was poverty-stricken and sickly. And then we have the rich man. You say, well, Father, we see him in a place of desperation in the afterlife. Is he there because he was rich? And the answer is no. It wasn't that he was rich, but it was that the only thing he was concerned about in life was his own comfort and the riches which he'd accumulated, and he was not mindful of God. The Bible says very clearly, the disciples asked Jesus when he gives them some pretty tough sayings about the rich man, like the camel going through the eye of a needle, and they said, who then can be saved? If a rich person who we believe to be blessed by God can't be saved, then who on earth can be saved? 
And Jesus says, with God, all things are possible. And I think if we look at it, we start to see that Jesus is really touching on what's your heart's desire? Because he speaks about this treasure of the heart. The, the uh, mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart. And so if we have within our heart peace and tranquility towards God and acceptance of the lot in which he has given us, then we are inclined towards God and whether we're rich or we're poor really doesn't matter. Now, what we do with our riches matters. St. John Chrysostom, I believe it was, it said that the, uh, the poor, let me get this right, uh, the rich need the poor for their salvation and the poor need the rich for their sustenance. Because you see, you, the thing is, if we do have this abundance of, of material wealth, the question is, what do we do with it? And if we spend it all on ourselves and we're stingy and we're mean in the context of mean and miserly, then that tells us that that's the condition of our heart. But if we have abundance, that tells us that we have this abundance in our heart. And so Lazarus finds himself in a place of blessing in the afterlife because his heart was always inclined towards God regardless of his circumstances, and the no-name man finds himself in separation from the blessings of God because his heart was always on the material things of the world and he can't bring those material things with him. A year ago or two years ago, I, I talked about you really can take it with you. And it was the whole point that what we have as our focus in this life, that is what we're going to take into our afterlife. If our focus is completely on the physical uh, satisfaction in the, in the flesh here of this world, that's what we're going to try to bring with us into the next world. But the problem is you can't take that. But if we focus on God in this life and we have a relationship with God and a relationship with his people and a relationship of kindness towards those around us, we get to take that with us. It's a continuation the body ends, but the soul moves into this next stage. It's a continuation of the projection, the projection that we have in this life. In the Brothers Karamazov, there's a story told where a very, and I like the way he says it, a very wicked, wicked woman died and she found herself in the lake of fire. And her guardian angel was strolling along the lakeside and saw her there and he's thinking, what can I present to God that would recommend to him that he would remove her from the lake of fire? And he says, oh, I remember one time she gave a spring onion, you know, one of those long green onions. She gave a spring onion to a, to a beggar lady. I'll present that to the Lord. And so the angel took the spring onion to the Lord and he says, this wicked, wicked woman one time gave this onion to a beggar lady. And the Lord said, okay, take that onion. Does anybody know this story? It's a great story. And I'm telling it really well, I might. Okay. <laughs> it's a great story. And so the, uh, the, the uh, Lord said, take that onion and go to her and reach the onion out to her, and, and she can grab a hold of that onion, and if the onion doesn't break, and you can pull her out of the lake of fire, she can come to paradise. Angel's excited. Goes to the lake of fire, and reaches out to this, what? <laughs> wicked, wicked woman. He reaches out the onion, and he says, take a hold that you might be lifted up from the lake of fire. And the woman reaches out in desperation and she gets a hold of that onion. And the angel's pulling her and he's pulling her and he's pulling her and he's almost got her out. And the people around her see that she's escaping from the lake of fire. And the story tells us they reach out and they grab her by the ankle and they grab her by the calf. And she starts screaming, let go of me, let go of me, it's my onion. And the onion broke, and she fell back into the lake of fire. 
And in the book it says where she remains to this day. What's this a picture of? It tells us something. It tells us that this woman in this stinginess that she had, she took with her into the afterlife. Now, interesting, if you read on in the story of Brothers Karamazov, the woman that's telling this little parable says, I'm that woman, and goes on to talk about how she's a wicked, wicked woman. She had some self-reflection. We need to have self-reflection. We need to ask ourselves, am I that wicked, wicked woman? Or wicked, wicked man? <laughs> or do I have generosity in my heart? Do I have love in my heart? Or do I find myself clinging to what's mine, holding on to that which is uh, so important to me? When Laurel and I lived in another state, we had a lady that we knew there that was so caught up in material things that if she found, let's say, for example, a coffee pot that she really liked the way that coffee pot worked, she would go buy three more and put them on a shelf for fear that hers would break down and she could not go out and get that same coffee pot again. And so what happened was is she had a stockpile of all these things because, you see, unfortunately, this was an expression of her brokenness, that there was something that was broken inside of her which should lead us to compassion and sympathy. But she found her security in these things. Do we find ourselves secure in God or do we find ourselves secure in the material things of the world and, and when maybe, for example, our health starts to decline, do we freak out or do we trust the Lord? When, when we go through that month where there's still month left but no money, anybody ever been there? Do we freak out because we trust in the dollar bill or do we have peace in knowing that God will provide? doesn't mean that we act irresponsibly, but rather that we trust God. Dr. Jordan Peterson has a program out that's called Future Authoring. And what it is, is it's you sit down and you write down where you want your life to be in three to five years. You take a look at your life, you go through a, a very sincere uh, self-assessment of where you're at, whether where you're at spiritually, where you're at financially, where you're at emotionally, where you're at relationally, um, you know, what is the condition of your, shall we say, life and soul right now. And then you write down where you want to be in three to five years. And then you take steps to get to the place where you want to be in three to five years. They say those who fail to plan, plan to fail. Well, what he's saying is, is you need to focus on your life and ask yourself, where do I want to be in three to five years? Because here's the fact of the matter is, no man is guaranteed tomorrow, nor woman, by the way. And the reality is, we need to be ready now. And we need to be in the process of engaging God in our lives and saying, you know, Lord, in three years and in five years, I really want to be a person of prayer. So what do I need to do? Any guess? Pray. Start praying today. And then be very specific about it. I'll do this. You know, Lord, in three to five years, um, <clears throat> I want to lose weight and I want to be in better shape. So what do I need to do? I need to start to focus on that now. I did see a funny thing on the Facebook. It says, you know, I've been trying to get back to my original weight and have been unsuccessful. And then after all, I realized that six pounds, three ounces is rather undoable in the first place. I'm laying claim to that, baby. So, <clears throat> but you know what? Do I want to be uh, in God's grace when it comes to my physical body? Yes. So what I have to do is I have to say no to gluttony and I have to say yes to fasting and self-restraint and all those things. But I won't get there if I'm not doing what's necessary to get there. And the reality is, is we need to understand in the getting there, we might come to that final train stop on the way towards God, and that's it. And so what we need to see is the trajectory that we have in our life of what we desire when that moment comes is where we're headed in the next one, in the continuation. And if all we care about are the material things of this world, that's all we'll want to hold on to in the next, and we'll be tortured over it. 
But if we have a heart towards God and towards people and loving one another, we don't care if they grab onto our ankles if we're getting hauled out by an onion because we want them to come with us as well. Amen? Amen. God's probably got us all holding on to an onion right now. And he wants to haul us out of our mess. So brothers and sisters, my encouragement to you today is stop, take stock of where do I want to go? I want to be with the Lord. So begin, if you haven't already, to uh, fast and pray, to give alms, to be engaged in things that feed your soul and your spirit. Not be lulled to sleep by the TV, by the political news, not be engaged in all those things that are fleeting and passing away. But rather, but rather cry out to God, trusting that he will rest you too in the bosom of Abraham and he will welcome you into his heavenly kingdom. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.